and welcome to Market Domination. I'm Julie Hyman with Josh Lipton. Live from our New York City headquarters, we are giving you the ultimate investing playbook to help tune out the noise and make the right moves for your money. And here's your headline blitz, getting you up to speed one hour before the closing bell rings on Wall Street. In a higher interest rate environment, certainly higher than 0 to 1% or 0 to 2%, stocks traditionally do very well. So I think we're recalibrating that. We still think from these levels, stocks are higher at year end. Now, our official year end target is 5,100. Our bull case is 5,500. We published that in November. So we, we think that we're gonna, the, the market post earnings could get a little bit softer and give us an opportunity to be a little bit more aggressive in terms of buying stocks lower. Boeing needs to do three things here. Uh, they need to understand lessons learned, develop a good understanding of what the issues were, what went wrong, uh, implement the changes, and hopefully uh, the new CEO and the 90-day plan that we're working on right now does that. In the last fourth quarter of 2023, there was an order inflow of more than $9 billion, and in the second half of the year, $13 billion. So it's, it's just lumpy. And ASML already said for a long time that you never look too close to uh, the order inflow. We've got one hour to go until the market close. Let's take a look at the major averages here. We are not seeing much change in the Dow in particular. It's down just about 18 points, but that's not even good for a drop of a tenth of 1% after it had that sort of a late day move downward yesterday. The S&P 500 a little bit more deeply in the red here, about four tenths of 1%, and the Nasdaq Composite down nine tenths of 1%. We continue to watch sort of political events that unfold today, including an announcement by uh, President Joe Biden that he would like to impose more tariffs on steel and aluminum coming into the United States. So that's something to watch. Um, and then there's, of course, still a lot of earnings that we're sifting through as well. All of this this, of course, the backdrop for which is rates and what's going on there, actually seeing a little bit of relief on the rate front in today's session, down seven basis points on the 10-year. And how does that translate into what we're seeing in terms of the sectors? We've got tech that's performing the worst today, as you saw from that underperformance of the NASDAQ, off 1.2% the XLK, industrials and real estate also down. We've got utilities and financials that are higher today. And Josh has got an individual stock and really a sector as well that we're watching. Yeah, Drew, let's talk chips, and in particular, ASML, uh, which is in focus today. A, a very important name. Remember, this the company that produces the equipment used to make chips, and they are getting nailed, as you can see there in today's trade. They reported investors clearly disappointed, bookings uh, coming in lower than what the street was looking for. So now how do you think about kind of what to do with the stock here? And this is a matter of a lot of debate today on, on the street. There are skeptics uh, questioning now with this report what this now means for 2025 sales. Is that at risk, they ask. On the other hand, Julie, bulls are going to point to uh, the company's backlog. There's been also kind of more recent positive commentary from a big ASML client, uh, TSMC. They kind of said a more recently positive, mm -hmm. bullish about what's ahead. And of course, we're now you know building new fabs in this country long term. That should be good for ASML as well. But clearly today, right now at least, uh, the worry is winning. Yeah, and it's interesting because what ASML makes is not just chip making equipment, but the most advanced chip making the equipment. The most cutting edge, and right. And that's where the orders were particularly weak. ASML actually had relatively strong orders into China where it's not allowed to sell Correct. that uh, particularly advanced equipment. So it's still seeing that strong demand in China for the sort of not as advanced chip making equipment. So that was sort of an interesting nuance in the report. And ASML executives seemed sort of optimistic that China demand would continue. They also said that 2024 is going to be a transition year in terms of where we are in the chip cycle. So that's something uh, to think about as well. But keep in mind the backdrop for all of this is we're in earnings season. Tech is supposed to be where it's at. That's yeah. where the growth is supposed to come from. So is this an early sign that maybe that's going to be a disappointment? I think it's too much to extrapolate that, but it's something that investors are, are now thinking about. Yeah, and orders for ASML, listen, they sell you know these expensive machines, so they can be kind of lumpy. And expectations too, Julie. I mean, it stocks down today, even still with this with this decline today, it's still up about twenty percent this year. It was up about fifty percent since early November. So yeah. also, obviously, expectations right. hot heading into the news. Yeah, right. good point. Well, as we watch stocks fall with about an hour to go in the trading day, investors' interest rate worries 
news has continued to weigh on the market. And while the expectation is for the next move from the Fed to be a rate cut, our first guest today says, well, you don't want to take a rate hike out of your calculations, potentially. Let's welcome in Skylar Wynand, Regan Capital CIO. Skylar, thanks uh, so much for being here. There have been a few out there, uh, including the likes of Larry Summers, who've said maybe, maybe we should be getting a hike here. Do you think we shouldn't? Do you think that's actually a possibility? Definitely. I think, you know, one of the first things Jay Powell did when he got nominated and elected as a Fed chair is really look back on the history in terms of, uh, you know, what Volcker and what Greenspan and some of his predecessors did. So he's a student of history. He's a pre-GFC guy where, you know, he's very concerned about the U.S. consumer and he's very concerned about uh, inflation not coming down. Um, inflation is really what is affecting the economy, not the stock market, not real estate. It's uh, folks that earn a W-2 and are spending more money at the gas pump in the grocery store. So if anything. But, but Skylar, the economy is doing ahead. just fine, isn't it, by most metrics? That that's inflation. The, I mean, that's that, the problem, right, is that there's a tremendous amount of wealth that's been created since COVID. $40 trillion in U.S. wealth has been created since the year 2020. That's housing. That's the stock market. So financial conditions are excellent. It begs the question, why would they even think about cutting rates so when is it, is Skylar, inflation's is your, high and unemployment's doing great? Skylar, what's your base case there? Is your base case they just hold steady this year? Yeah, for sure. And, and they, they have a very, very minute window to cut, which is June. That's the only possible time for them to cut. They're not going to cut in, be, in July, which is in between the, the Republican and Democrat convention. They're not going to cut in the fall right before the election. So June is the only possibility for them to cut. And the data is telling us that why? <laughs> you know, everything's going great. If anything, the economy, the economy is running too hot and they might need to raise interest rates. OK, so if they are not going to cut this year, I mean, stocks until recently, until we saw uh, yields start to rise more considerably, stocks were holding up pretty well. So what happens with yields? What happens with stocks um, if we don't get any move this year? Right. So we see the front end of the curve, T-bills, twos, kind of staying where they're at, you know, five and a quarter, five and a half on, on money markets. Twos are right at around five percent. What's going to happen is the back end, anywhere from you know five years out to 30 years, are going to continue to increase. So that's going to hurt traditional fixed income. It's going to hurt you know long dated munis and bonds. But I think you know we're just getting back to normal. We've had an inverted curve for almost two years. Yeah, we might see a bear steepener, which means the back end increases, and that's going to bring stocks down to, to normality, so to speak. You know, we were just at almost 10% gain in the first quarter here. Now we're back to about a 6% gain, which is still an annualized 18 to 20% gain. But I think earnings are gonna do great. The economy's great. Corporate balance sheets are great. The interest rates aren't really affecting them. And they're not really affecting consumers, the bulk of which are locked into a 3% mortgage. So interest rates and higher rates haven't really uh, had much of an effect on the economy yet. And it might take an extra year or two to see that. And Skylar, let me just get your quick take, though. You know, going back to yields, um, you get seeing some relief today. But 10-year, we are back to 4, 5, 8 here. Um, at what level is that, Skylar, a problem for the stock market? Is it here? Is it is it 5%? It's well above 5%, if not 6%, right? I think we, we were at 5% on Halloween of uh, six months ago. And memories are short, but we rallied really quick from five down to 380. Now we're back to about 4.6. I think we can at least tolerate five. Once we get to six, then it's a, hey, can companies really pay that, <laughs> you know, as a, as a new cost of capital when it's been three to five for a long time? Um, but, you know, when that happens, we'll again have a steep curve, which benefits traditional fixed income, benefits even corporations that carry trade, 
where they can borrow short and invest long. So that steepener, while it might be a little bit painful if you own long duration, will eventually help the economy. When, when are we getting to six, Skylar? <laughs> uh, it could be quicker than we think, you know, but I think that's when you really go all in on, on fixed income, especially longer duration fixed rate assets. We hear people every day from the big institutions saying, hey, now's the time to buy fixed income at 4.5% or 5%. But if you're buying it into an inverted curve, traditional fixed income metrics and, and ways of doing business don't work. Bond ladders don't work. The carry trade doesn't work. So we could see, and we said we had a really bad 30 year auction last year, uh, last week, where, you know, the tail was something like, you know, six basis points above where, where the market was trading. So I don't know if the demand's there on the long end, um, whether it's pensions, insurance companies, or foreign governments. But yeah, I think we can survive upwards of about 6% before um, we really see that effect seeping into the stock market. Skylar, thank you so much for helping us kick off the show today. Appreciate it. Thank you all. We are just getting started here on Market Domination. Coming up, we're going to hear from Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan. It's coming up later in the hour, talking inflation, the state of the consumer, and of course, a lot more. And stick around for the latest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll get investor insight on two assets to help you make the best choices for your portfolio. All that and more on Market Domination.
Tesla filing a preliminary proxy statement ahead of its annual meeting, which will be June 13th. The two big requests from the EV maker that shareholders ratify CEO Elon Musk's 2018 pay package and approve the company's reincorporation to Texas, moving it out of Delaware. Joining us now is Charles Elson, the founding director of the Weinberg Center for Corporate Governance at the University of Delaware. Charles, it is good to see you. And I want to start here, Charles, and help me think through this. If Tesla shareholders, Charles, if they vote and approve this pay package for Musk, does that mute um, or sort of supersede that the judge's original decision from a few months ago, Charles, which argued there was a, a breach of fiduciary duty here? I don't believe so. I mean, you have to look at the ruling in a couple of ways. She talked about a poor process. She talked about a lack of independence on the part of the directors. Uh, which obviously it's the same plan they put out before. There's nothing new here. They haven't done anything differently. It's same people, same plan. Uh, but the key is at the end of the ruling, and this is, the, I think, quite important, she said that the compensation was not effectively fair, that you didn't need to give this man so much stock because he already had so much stock, and that she ordered rescission, that the plan had to stop. That's very interesting because effectively it's a fairness analysis, not necessarily on the process, but the result. And look, let's say all the, the shareholders, let's say they approve it. Frankly, to give money away, give make a gift to someone that has no corporate purpose, if you think about it, has to be approved by all the shareholders, not just the majority. And you can have a vote and you would still have a, quote, unfair package to the corporation unless everyone votes for it. And obviously you have a plaintiff here and that person certainly isn't. And I doubt uh, some others as well. That's the real issue here. And that was the key to that ruling. It was uh, basically the judge said poor process, poor independence, but effectively in result wasn't fair. And that's, I think, you've got to think about it. That Delaware always has the right, it's a court of equity, to judge the fairness of the equity, if you will, of a, of a particular action. And this was determined to be inequitable. And that it's really hard to get around that unless everyone agrees to it or they reformulate it. And of course, Charles, one of the other things that Tesla is trying to get shareholders to approve is actually a change of where it's domiciled, that it would change to Texas and so be subject to the courts there. Um, do you think that that will be successful? And could Delaware courts even block that move? Well, yeah, there there is there are some actions in Delaware now where folks have sought to leave Delaware to avoid Delaware jurisdiction in a particular on a particular issue. I think that would be challengeable. But the real question is, why would a shareholder vote for a move that the CEO says a court has decided against me because what I did was inequitable? So I'm going to a jurisdiction where, where they'll say that's OK. That Delaware protects shareholders, yet I, I'm going to move to a place where I'm telling well, you. Well, the, uh, the answer is, don't. Charles, because the shareholders of Tesla have faith in Elon Musk, which is why they approve the, the pay package in the first place. I mean, couldn't you argue if the shareholders want to do that, why not let them do well, it? it, it but I, I would really be surprised if the large institutional holders would agree to that. It's against their interest in any way you look at it. And frankly, who's to say a Texas court won't do exactly the same thing, won't respect the Delaware ruling. It, it's a very sound ruling. There's nothing odd about it. He can appeal it to the Supreme Court, which I assume he'll do. But, you know, that's up to the Supreme Court. If they find it was inequitable, they'll strike it down. But the point is, you can't change states because you don't like the court you're in. You don't like the results you've got. Uh, that's a very strange idea if you think about it. Oh, I, I'm not happy with the answer you gave me, so I'll just go to somebody else. Uh, I mean, that's not the way it's done legally in this country. And uh, I think the shareholders hopefully will agree. If, he, if, if the judge thinks the package was problematic and the Supreme Court agrees, then perhaps it's time to refresh the board and come up with a different package. But to simply leapfrog a court uh, and move somewhere else, I'm moving out of the United States because I don't like their law. That doesn't make sense either. The law protects the shareholders. It protects the investors. Certainly Delaware does, but I'm sure Texas does too. But uh, it's a very odd response, and I'd be very surprised uh, if, if a majority agreed to it. They may. You never know. But I think it'd be rather foolish on their part to do so. And I, the question is, will, would Delaware let them evade a ruling by moving to another state? Would Texas let them do it? I, that's a problem for Texas. Texas your, uh, decisions are enforced in Delaware. Should they not be anymore? I mean, that makes no sense. I, I think it's a... Uh, 
it's a grandstanding move that uh, you know gets a lot of talk and chatter from uh, from folks. But I, I don't know if real if in the end it's realistic or frankly fair to the shareholders. Simply so, stated. So Charles, just briefly then, where do you think this all leaves uh, Tesla Elon Musk pay package? What do you think the outcome of all, all this is? You know, that's a really good question. He, you know, obviously made a lot of money with his equity in the company, but uh, he wants more. Look, at some point, you know, someone says, if you don't give me this, I'm going to blow myself up. You have to say, in the end, OK. Uh, you know, look, the company has to survive Elon Musk. The obligation of the director is to assure that Tesla's value is perpetual, not based on one person. One person dies, leaves. Uh, that's that can't be the end of the company. And at some point, you have to say enough. But that's where I think you need board refreshment. And obviously, this board is unwilling to do it. it, it at some point, no one is that good or that indispensable. And I think that's the problem here. It, it's more of the the hype, if you will, around the personality cult as opposed to what's happening. Look, Tesla has lost value this year. Tesla's got some issues. Yeah, and we've been running the company. Okay, are you delighted that the stock has gone down you know, this year or that production profits are off? Obviously, something is not right there. Right. And are you going to say, thanks so much, here's, a, here's $55 billion, you're terrific, because you won't, either you get, you get it or you leave. That makes no sense well, in the end. Really business. We'll see what ends up happening. Charles, <laughs> great to get your perspective. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks. We got some calls of the day now for you. Let's start with Urban Outfitters. Jeffrey's downgrading the stock to underperform, citing risk to shares of the company based on slowing traffic data. Uh, this was an interesting note uh, coming from the team over there, Corey Tarlow, Randy Connick, et cetera. And those guys talking about increasing competition and losing market share from Urban Outfitters from the likes of Xi'an, of course, the, the Chinese company, as well as Abercrombie, and even... I, I thought this was interesting, even mentioning Old Navy and Gap yeah. as gaining some traffic numbers. Yeah, saw acceleration and trends at some competitors, mentioned Abercrombie, Old Navy, Gap stores. Um, but on Urban Outfitters says we see uh, recovery to flat comps by Q4 as bumpy. Uh, new leadership appointments help, the analyst saying, but market share shifts likely to remain sticky. He's pointing out uh, Abercrombie, for example, has been gaining share. Stock is down today, basically flat so far this year. Mm -hmm. In terms of the street, uh, three buys, nine holds, and now officially one bear over at Jeffries. Yes, the lone one. The lone yeah. one. Doesn't mean he's wrong. Turning now to GE Vernova, Raymond James initiating coverage on that one with an outperform rating. So Raymond James, they like what they see here, initiated outperform. Price target is 160. Says the company combines strength across a broad spectrum of conventional and renewable generation as well as grid technology. Uh, Vernova, they say, involved in practically everything. Yes, and by everything they mean when you're talking about renewable energy, power, the power business, the wind business, and electrification, basically the updating of the grid. Now, wind and electrification, according to the analysts, had negative EBITDA margins in recent years. So power is where the cash is going to be coming from, although the other two areas are growing more quickly. But to your point, the analyst there likes that they're sort of, and it's Pavel, by the way, Malchanov over there, um, at Raymond James, who is initiating the coverage, he does like that they're exposed to sort of multiple different areas of the renewable energy story. Yeah, uh, earnings announcement, by the way, looks like April 25th, so expect more uh, news and insight at that we'll point. We'll be looking for it. Coming up, it's the latest edition of our series, Goodbye or Goodbye. Today, we're going big with a look at exchange operators. What's the best way to play it? Find out next on Market Domination.
It's a big, noisy universe of stocks out there. Welcome to Goodbye or Goodbye. Our goal is to help cut through that noise to navigate the best moves for your portfolio. Today, we're scoping out the financial landscape via Exchange Operator. So what's the best way to play it? I'm here with Yuri Kojimirian. He is Tema ETF's Chief Investment Officer. Yuri, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. So we have not yet talked about exchanges on Goodbye or Goodbye, so this is a, a good one to dig into. And let's start with the stock that you do like, and that is Intercom. Continental Exchange, also known as ICE. The shares have gone up pretty much over the past six months or so after being flattish for the prior six months. So let's go through your case. Um, first of all, it's not just an exchange operator, right? They're a data, uh, data provider. And they are also they also just made an acquisition, a company called Black Knight, that will help them expand into the mortgage market. Talk, talk to us about why that's attractive. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, financial exchanges, they're all about data. They're about understanding how you know, the trades that happen on these exchanges, how to collect that and how to create data. And it's about ease of transactions. And what ICE has done quite ambitiously relative to other exchanges is to go, okay, can we apply this to another very, very large financial market, which is mortgages? So they've gone in, they've acquired a few select technology businesses. They've spent somewhere in the region of $25 billion acquiring these, Black Knight being the latest example, which I think they paid $13 billion for. And so the idea is, can we put all of this technology together and create essentially a one data chain for the entire mortgage process, from origination to servicing to all kinds of other parts of the mortgage process, effectively making it like a financial instrument, which is a really interesting strategy. Hmm, that is interesting. All right, so let's get to the second thing here. Um, finance increasingly moving on exchange. What, talk to us about what you mean by that. Yeah, so if you think about how the world looked maybe 30 or 40 years ago, a lot of transactions, financial transactions, were happening on paper, over the phone. And what's happening is a lot of this was quite risky, right? And we saw with the financial crisis and all of these things, we need to centralize where these transactions are happening. We need to clear them. We need to create risk parameters around them. And exchanges are a perfect place for that. And so what you see is more and more financial transactions are being moved onto exchange. I mean, even the rise of Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies, this is a very similar sort of thing. Can we centralize it? Can we? really get more and more information out of these trades, which helps regulators, helps users, decreases costs, decreases friction, and creates data businesses for these companies. And for people who don't know, ICE owns the New York Stock Exchange, but it also owns a number of other exchanges, yeah. and not just stock exchanges, for other types of financial instruments, to your point. Yeah, so they're big in interest rate derivatives, and they're big in energy. They, they own the Brent complex, so everything that's traded in terms of Brent and oil, so they have huge commodity businesses. They're also really big in carbon, so they're running the carbon emissions markets in Europe and also in the United States. And it's really one of their biggest and core franchises. There's also trading of fixed income and other areas right. as well. And then finally as well, you, it's a founder-led business. Jeffrey Sprecher is the guy who started it, leads the business still. Yeah, I mean, it's a fascinating history of how he set up this business. And really, it was a, a brilliant idea and insight. And he's still leading the business today. That's quite rare in some of these large financial businesses. MSCI is another example of that, where you have- and Active brokers as well. I yeah, believe. exactly. And so you have founders in some of these financial businesses, and they're really still driven and building this. And that's why you know, he's prepared to take this risk, like what he's doing in the mortgage market, to do something different to create a lot of value for shareholders, which he's done in the past already. So when we talk about these, we always like to mention what the downside risk could be. And in this case, post-deal leverage. As you said, they've made a lot of acquisitions. Yeah, so the Black Knight was the latest acquisition. The balance sheet's a bit more levered than you know, the classic exchange. These are cash machines, though. So over time, they'll surely delever and maybe start buybacks or other ways of returning money to shareholders. They need to invest in these businesses as well because it's a difficult transition technology-wise. But over time, that's what we think will happen. But leverage is always a bit of a risk, right? Things can go wrong, and so you have to watch that as an equity investor. And just quickly, do you have a position in ICE? We do, yeah. So we own ICE in our fund, which is focused on monopolistic businesses. And this is a perfect monopoly. It's all about network effects. The more people trade on each side, liquidity begets more liquidity and creates strength for ICE as a business. Gotcha. Interesting. So let's get to the stock that you do not like, and that is the owner of the Hong Kong Exchange. And no shares have fallen quite a bit over the past year or so. So let's get to why you don't like it. First of all, you're looking at the valuation. And I believe you're valuing it enterprise value to EBITDA, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, to actually, to EBIT is the way That's probably gotcha. we look at that. But I think the key thing is the enterprise value, which often is miscalculated. If you look at services like Bloomberg, actually the way they put EV onto the, the screen is not as good as you know if you do it yourself. And if you do that, you find that ICE actually, despite the fall in the share price, is quite, oh, sorry, 
Hong Kong Stock Exchange, despite the fall in share price, is actually quite an expensive share. And this is really strange given you know, the growth profile of the business. Interesting. OK, so let's uh, get to our next point, which is you think the growth that they have had is hard to sustain. Yeah, look, I, I think there's no secret here, right, that effectively what's happening is mainland Chinese investors are preferring the A-share market in mainland China, and foreign investors are actually shunning shares. I mean, we see one of the most successful ETF stories is the Emerging Markets X China ETF, and I think there's a bit of a, a move away for by foreign investors from Chinese capital markets, and really the people that feel the biggest brunt are the exchanges, like the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And that network effect that I was talking about, it's really powerful on the way up, but it's also really powerful on the way down. It can really tear a monopoly apart, and that's why we think that you know, the growth can't be sustained of this business. And, and similarly here, losing market share, because you know, when we tend to talk about the Hong Kong Stock Exchange here in the US and our coverage is when a company's deciding where to list, for example, yeah. and they're making the choice of some place like Hong Kong or London or the US. And so they're losing share that way, I assume, in terms of also trading share. Yeah, so look, as you probably remember a couple of years ago, it was really popular for European businesses to list. So we're talking about Prada, Samsonite, uh, L'Occitane. And now you read the rhetoric from these companies and they're all saying, you know, actually we'd rather delist from Hong Kong. The theory before was these are consumer businesses, the biggest consumer markets in the world, the growing ones are in Asia, we should be closer and listed there. But actually what they found is their share prices are trading at big discounts to their peers in Europe, and especially to the ones in the United States. This is really bad. We've seen this with the London Stock Exchange. It's, it's really a game of where you can get the best valuation as a company. And I'm not sure if you're in a boardroom deciding where you're going to list, the Hong Kong Stock Exchange is going to be the place you're going to pick. Interesting. Well, just as we talked about what could go wrong for ICE, let's talk about what could go right for this. And that's a cut in the stamp duty. Again, not something we talk about that often here. Yeah, look, so exchanges, their lifeblood is trading, right? So the more trading that happens, the more money they make effectively. And there's a ways of incentivizing trading, and one of them is stamp duty. You know, In lots of countries around the world, you pay a bit of a tax to the government for trading shares or trading financial instruments. And what's happening in, in Hong Kong is there's going to be a cut in that stamp duty, which might incentivize trading by brokers, but also by local residents. Look, this is quite well telegraphed. It's definitely a risk. It could drive trading up and improve some of the numbers. But beyond that, it's hard to see what growth happens in this stock and this company. And just quickly, what if there was also more of a rebound in the Chinese economy and Chinese stocks came more back into vogue? Would Hong Kong exchange also get some of the halo effect of that? Yeah, absolutely. That is definitely another risk, right? So as you can see, the share price has been under pressure. Pressure. It's hard to see how that happens necessarily in the financial markets. I think it will happen in consumer markets and other areas like gotcha. real estate. But yeah, you could see a sentiment-led bounce in the stock. And that probably would be a great time to you know, load up a short, if you will. Um, and do you have any position in this one? We don't, no. OK. OK, so let's summarize what you're telling investors here. Buy Intercontinental Exchange, also known as ICE, as it tries to do something different, entering the mortgage market, expanding there, and also finance increasingly moving into exchanges. On the other side, stay away from Hong Kong Stock Exchange, highly valued, might have a hard time sustaining that growth, and it's also losing market share in listings. Thanks so much, Yuri. Really course, appreciate you being here. Thank you very much. And thank you for watching Goodbye or Goodbye. We'll be bringing you new episodes three times a week at 3.30 p.m. Eastern. Taking a look at some trending tickers in today's trade, Autodesk provides an update on further delay of its annual report amid that ongoing probe into its accounting. Um, so here's what sounds like going on with this one, Julie. The software maker is now saying, listen, we're going to have to delay that annual report because of this probe we're doing. Remember, earlier this month, the company said it was looking into its own free cash flow and non-GAAP operating margin practices and had said, all right, Given that, we're going to need some extra time to file the 10K. Now it sounds like they're saying, hey, we're going to need to even more time. Extra, extra time. They did <laughs> emphasize no expected impact to financial statements or kind of commentary from the earnings report they delivered back in February, but investors clearly nervous about that headline. Yeah, and you can see the shares have sort of come down as these announcements have piled up. Analysts are um, concerned that, uh, including um, those at Citi, are concerned that what this new announcement means is just that the issue could be more complex mm -hmm. and layered, complicated than uh, previously thought. So unclear now when exactly this is going to be happening. It does sound like both the company and some of the analysts say they're not worried about a delisting here, that they think that Autodesk will get it done. And, and a delisting, they have longer 
before they would be delisted potentially. Yeah, I to saw file this, a this note from Barclays, um, and they're overweight the name, but and they said you know that headline was disappointing, um, but said it did not sound like the investigation was going to result in restatements mm. or pulling any guidance. They say it was comforting to hear the scope of the investigation has remained the same, but. Investor clearly, at least right now, not not as comforted. Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about Rivian too. Those shares are sliding on reports that they're cutting. Um, actually, are they sliding? No, they are not sliding. They're in fact still higher. They're sliding. Popping a bit. Oh, from their highs of the session here. So they're, what's happening is they're cutting more jobs here. The second round of layoffs this year uh, that we're seeing from Rivian. Rivian has obviously been struggling here. Uh, they had cut 10% of their salaried staff before, and now they're cutting um, more jobs. So it could be, what, about 150 people. Yeah, I mean, these cover these broader worries too, Julie, for the industry about EV slowdown, ongoing Price wars for electric autos, um, and you know, obviously for a profitable company like a Rivian or a Lucid, it's even kind of tougher environment to navigate. Um, the stock has been really, I mean, it's now down about sixty percent this year. Yeah. That is, you know, perhaps maybe baking a lot of bad news because worth pointing out, most analysts at this point bullish on that name. Well. We'll, we'll, see see. If it, we'll see if it ends up bouncing. All right, coming up, an interview with Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan. That's coming up next on Market Domination.
out of Bank of America always give a great snapshot into the health of the U.S. consumer. Let's get right to Bank of America CEO Brian Moynihan after these results. Brian, always nice to spend some time with you. Thank you for joining Yahoo Finance. Really, we've been uh, getting some, some mixed reads on the health of the consumer. Retail sales, inflation is still high. How financially challenged are U.S. households? Well, uh, Brian, it's good to be with you again, and uh, congratulations to all my teammates on another strong quarter. Um, and underlying our company, obviously, is you know, we do business with every other American household, so it's a deep data set. We've tracked it for many years along multiple dimensions, among their borrowing, among their spending, and among the money in their accounts, among their investing patterns, those that invest. And so if you look at it all together, we'll see a couple key things. First, on you know, sort of their spending behavior, which is what we see every week, basically, we get it rolled up. It's across four and a half trillion dollars for uh, a year, more or less. And it's growing at about a 5 percent rate, 4 to 5 percent rate over what it grew last March and in the end of April here. But if you think about it going back to this time last year, it was probably double digits, 10 percent, and a little bit before that, it was even stronger than that. And so what has happened is it's gone from 10 percent down to 5 percent and kind of held here for the last six months. And that means the U.S. consumer activity is slowing down, but that is not stopping, and that is consistent with a lower growth, lower inflation, more normalized U.S. economy. And you're seeing that go on even as we, not only in March, but as we, in the first quarter, but also as we enter April. Do you think uh, just this, this sticky level of inflation a lot of us keep looking at, is that causing some of the consumer spending slowdown? Well, if you think about it, inflation makes things cost more. So the dollar volume come up, the real levels will come down. If you look at where they're spending it, it's kind of interesting because, you know, if you thought they were, the consumer was really holding back because of inflationary prices, they wouldn't be spending on things that have really price flexibility into them. So, but they are. They're spending on entertainment. On uh, restaurant spending is growing faster than uh, uh, food at stores spending, and th that means that they are making choices, spending sort of discretionary and necessary in the same percent percentages they spent uh, pre-pandemic, and that means they're kind of in a normal pattern. So I would say inflation is on their minds because things became more expensive, and they can remember when, and remember when what means, when it was 10 percent cheaper, 15 percent cheaper. They can remember that because it's not that long ago, and yet they're sort of adjusting to that, and that's what happens, and that's why they slowed down the growth in spending, and that's why they're still spending. But the question is what happens next, and that's what we'll find out as we move through the quarters this year. Brian, you've been at this for, for, for quite some time. You've seen a lot of different economic cycles. Are, are you surprised inflation is just maybe not coming down as quickly as some had hoped? Well, when, when we talk to our experts uh, in our research team, which is the best in the world, they, you know, they've done research about how long it takes to uh, win the war on inflation definitively from inflation down to the, tr the target levels. You know, it takes two, three, four years. It's not something that happens overnight. And so, and especially given that coming out of the pandemic, the amount of stimulus that went in that was needed, and any amount of stimulus that went in that may not have been so needed, according to the economists, and any amount of other stimulus that went on top. Of that, when all the borrowing the you know, federal government did in the United States, the state governments did, and the governments around the world did, that put a lot of money in the economy, and we're still bringing that impact out. So, taking a few years from starting in 21 to you know into 25 to get it down to trend growth is really kind of consistent with the past. That's what the economists tell me. We'd all like it to be over tomorrow, so we could have certainty of where the Fed's going and what the you know terminal rate, the front end rate would be, or the neutral rate would be, and all the different debates. But the reality really is that they've got to win the war on inflation, and they are winning, and it's coming down, and they've got it on the right trend. And that, that's the great debate. Are they going to hold rates a little higher to make sure they've got it on the right trend? And so it's always been sticky. The, the past would tell you it would take a longer period of time, especially when they started late, and they admit that. It therefore took a little longer to ring out the system, or will take a little longer to ring out the system. Brian, I always love reading your, uh, your company's earnings reports. It's probably the most detailed banking earnings report out there in the game. So many great stats. And one that caught my attention was you added, I, I hope I'm right here, one million new credit cards. I mean, that is a mind-blowing figure. Who is opening these credit cards, and, and what do you think they're coming to you for? Well, in the end of the day, if you think about our credit card our capability, it's not a standalone credit card company. It's integrated into the, the way we do business. So we have a cu customer model, a consumers and wealthy people. They use credit cards. We give them rewards on those credit cards for using them, the preferred rewards, as we call it, about 90 percent of, uh, of our consumer balance are tied, uh, attributed to 
uh, preferred rewards customers. So the affinity that we reward them for is being part of Bank America, money offered to loans, deposits. And as people in the market see that offering, that you know, we have cash back programs like everybody else, but we really have this preferred rewards program where they can save money on their home loan in higher interest rate environments on their car loan. And they can get higher uh, savings rates. You know, they basically bring their credit card over too, so they get the entirety of the award, reward program. And so it's, it's integrated across all products, and that's why people come to us. It's a value proposition. It's a very competitive market, the credit card business is. So if they're taking a million new cards, that means we're offering something they want. There was a graphic that went around on, on Twitter, Brian, right after your earnings, showing the FICO scores in your various lines of business. And they are just just amazing. I mean, they're close to 800. Uh, how do you think, is this some of the best FICO scores you've ever seen amongst your consumers? And what do you think has been driving that? Well, the American consumer is employed, uh, and they are earning more money, and they're fighting with inflation, especially at the uh, you know, median income levels, and it's, it's tough on people and food prices and all that, not to make anything out, out of the human you know, uh, t issues that go on with this kind of inflation and as it tames and stuff, and that's why it has to be done. But at the end of the day, they're employed and earning more money and earning substantially more money than they earned pre-pandemic. They have more money in their accounts. and so. Their FICO scores score should be very strong, honestly, and, and, and they are. We've always been a prime underwriter. We've always underwritten to the very prime end of the spectrum uh, because of just who we are and how we run our company. Um, and so if you see, I think, a 770 on some of the scores uh, on the credit cards, uh, the, the scores at origination, and very strong, and we're very proud of that. The reality is, is our credit card charge-offs are back to where they were sort of pre-pandemic, and it's taken four years to get back there, but those are still you know, at that charge off rate, it's really in the all-time lows of the company's history, what was going on in 19 and 18. So it's not like we're normalizing to bad credit, we're normalizing to good credit, and we feel very good about the portfolio. Brian, I'll just say this, you have a large following here uh, within the Yahoo Finance community, and it's really because you always keep it real for us. Uh, Brian Monahan, the CEO of Bank America, thank you so much for, for giving us the time here. We greatly appreciate it. Thank you, Brian. All right, guys, back to you. Shares of Prologis tumbling after the warehouse owner trimmed its full-year guidance. The company saying it anticipates a slower leasing environment over the next quarter, citing persistently high interest rates. And real estate as a whole has su suffered under the Fed's higher for longer policy. It's actually the worst performing sector this year. With the timeline for cuts pushing further out, are there any opportunities there for investors? We're joined by Ben Miller, co-founder and CEO of Fundrise, and Uma Moriarty, Center Square senior investment strategist. Thank Thank you both for being here. So first of all, before we dig into how one might want to play real estate, I think the first question is whether people should be playing real estate. Uma, I'll start with you on this, because this is a group that tends to move inversely with rates. And as we've seen, rates are not really coming down here. Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I think part of the, the question, right, to your point is, when do we finally see the Fed cut rates from a policy perspective? We've been seeing these higher inflation prints, but one of the biggest parts of inflation as it comes through from reported data is shelter inflation. That's something as real estate investors we're seeing on a day-to-day -day basis in terms of where rents are compared to last year. We've been talking about how much of a lagging indicator that is. And so if you take into account real time shelter costs, right, it's much lower than what's being printed in those inflation prints. And so we think the fight in terms of inflation is trending in the right direction. And we still think maybe three rate cuts from the Fed could be in play this year. That being said, one of the biggest benefits of investors from a real estate perspective in terms of deploying new capital today REITs are really discounted from a valuation perspective compared to what you're seeing across the private market. So when you're trying to get exposure across the real estate asset class, REITs are providing a really great opportunity for investors today. Ben, same question to you. Just start at a high level. Should investors, you know, in your opinion, Ben, should they be moving into real estate right now? Is now a good time to commit capital in that sector? Our view is real estate bottomed. It bottomed uh, at the end of last year. And, uh, you know, real estate moves inversely with with interest rates, interest rates have peaked, and in my opinion, uh, they may go sideways for longer, but I don't think they're likely to go much up from here. And so there, there's much more room on, for the rates to come down. And as they do, when they do, that's gonna be a huge tailwind for real estate. And so on the interest rate environment, I think it's it went from zero rates to five. That was very hard on real estate. Now I think the, the, the asymmetries on the other side of it, 
And then on the ground, operations, operations have been healthy. GDP growth has been strong. So tenants are paying rent. There, there was a, a oversupply in 2021, 2022, and now we're starting to get to a more normal market. So I, I'm optimistic that, that we've hit the bottom and that this is a good time to be buying. And Ben, just to be clear here, it's my understanding you are invest. Well, where Uma's in the public markets, you're investing privately in real estate. Is that correct? And kind of talk to us about the relationship between the two markets. Yeah, I mean, we we largely do private. We've done both. Uh, you you want to go where the biggest discounts are. So the public markets had great discounts about a year ago. Uh, you know, the the REIT market has recovered a lot since then, and the private markets there's a lot more distress. There's a lot less liquidity. There's um, uh, a lot of people who borrowed too much in 2021, and I think you're starting to see some uh, some uh, market forces that are going to push them to have to sell at deep discounts. And so at this point, I think, although there's some, again, the, the public markets for real estate are a lot better than they were, but I think that there's a lot more um, sharpshooting opportunities in the private markets. Uma, just to bring you back in here, I know you mentioned how uh, you see opportunities in REITs. Where, where in the market do you see opportunity, Uma? You know, is it data center, healthcare? W what looks attractive to you? There's a couple of different things I think you can think about in terms of where to find those opportunities. One of those things, right, as, as we've been talking about, is that disconnect in terms of valuation between public and private markets. There are some deep discounts that you can still find for really high quality assets in the in the public markets and in some areas like multifamily, for example. But when we think about some of the secular trends and the alternative types of real estate property types that you can access in the REIT market that you can't quite access in the same way across the private market, Healthcare, you mentioned, is one of those areas. We think there are some really secular demand tailwinds that are fantastic for healthcare right now. You have a massive aging population that's aging into needs-based healthcare, whether it's senior housing, skilled nursing facilities. So we're seeing some really great demand tailwinds there. Data centers is another area, right? The, the amount of demand for data center space right now seems absolutely insatiable. So we should be seeing some really great fundamentals and leasing, leasing data coming out of the data center companies as we go through earnings season as well. Uma, are there specific healthcare REITs that you would recommend for investors right now or um, in the data center space? From the data center perspective, a, a name like Equinix comes to mind. Really, really high quality data centers. They have a great moat around them in some of the strongest data center markets where you really can't find access to more power, right? And so there's no new supply coming into some of these markets where Equinix has a really strong footprint. From, from a healthcare perspective, a name like Well Tower with a really strong senior housing portfolio is another area that we're bullish about. And just quickly, all I'm curious about office, which has been sort of like the place that has been the most troubled within real estate. Ben, Uma, just quickly for each of you, is that a place you would look? Ben, no. I'll start with you. <laughs> oh, you start. Okay, yeah, I, I I feel like office. Or the challenge with real estate is that it it it's a slow moving business. It's not like the day to day trading you see in the stock market where um, you can really transact information rapidly. The office industry is going to go through, I, I think, a decade-long decline, and the cascading negative effects of work from home are still in their early days. So I, I think it's premature to be investing in office. And Uma? You know, from a REIT perspective, as we think about office, I totally agree. There is a long tail ahead in terms of the correction that is yet to come. That being said, I think at the end of the day, you're going to have a very strong bifurcation in terms of the office that, that works and the office that doesn't. The benefit for the REIT market is that it's primarily made up of the highest quality assets in most of these major markets. And so that should be the office that survives at the end. The other thing I'll mention too here, as we start to see some really interesting opportunities in the private market, the REITs have spent the last, call it decade plus, really right-sizing their balance sheets. Their leverage levels are in check. They have access to debt capital across the unsecured bond market. So as you start to see some of these maturities in the private market come due, where you have some distressed opportunities, the REITs are really going to be able to play a little bit of offense and find opportunities to acquire accretively some of the best assets as they come to the market across the private market. Uma, Ben, thank you both for joining the show today. Appreciate it. Thanks for having us. While well, wrapping up today's market domination, don't go anywhere. We've got you covered with all the action following the closing bell. Stay tuned for market domination overtime.
There's the closing bell on Wall Street, and now it's market domination overtime. We are going to get you up to speed on the action from today's session, and let's start with where the major averages ended the day. The Dow very slightly in the red, not even a tenth of 1%, off by about 46 points uh, by the end of the day. The S&P off by a little more than a half of 1%. Tech leading declines here today, off by about 1.2%. So we continue to watch that sell-off unfold. And to dig a little bit more into that, let's take a look at the NASDAQ 100 here, where you see Alphabet, the only of the largest of the large cap that was higher on the day. NVIDIA participating in that chip-led sell-off that was really sparked by a forecast that was read as negative by the street and an earnings per share miss, I should say, from ASML, the big chip equipment maker. And so that's spreading through a lot of tech as well. But getting back to some of our trending tickers was interesting. There were some political announcements as well today, or developments, I should say, that also percolated through the uh, market. And we're seeing in our trending tickers page on Yahoo Finance. One of the stocks we were watching on that front was Snap. And obviously, this is a... a uh, illuminating intraday chart because you saw a big spike up when we learned that the legislation that could potentially force ByteTance to sell TikTok, divest from TikTok, or ban it in the United States, that that was being fast-tracked. So we saw the move upward and snap, obviously, a competitor to TikTok uh, on the day. And then the other uh, stock that stood out in that category, if I can get it back for you, was First Solar. And that's because there was some news about tariffs uh, that could advantage the likes of a first solar. So those shares moved up on the day as well. If I can't get the chart for you, I'll just send it back to uh, Josh in a minute. But here we go, first solar up about 3% on the day. Now I'll send it back to you. All right, Julia. Rocky day on Wall Street, the NASDAQ and the S&P 500 closing lower for the fourth day in a row here. Josh Schaefer's here with the takeaways from the trading day. Joshua. Yeah, Josh, Julie was sort of just highlighting this when we took a look at the NASDAQ 100, but what you saw for a lot of the day is big tech sort of leading the losses here. I mean, you take a look at our core MAG7 group, so to speak, right? And the only one that was up on the day was Alphabet. Significant drop in NVIDIA, significant drop in Amazon, Meta. Amazon and Meta were both off more than 1%. NVIDIA almost off 4%. Of course, that was largely tied to news in the semiconductor space itself. So I'm using the term tech here, but we're, we're going to go broad on, on the mm -hmm. term tech with that. But I think what's interesting, and our head of news, Miles Edlin, highlighted this this morning in our Yahoo Finance Morning Brief newsletter, is just these companies, the seven companies that we've talked about, or the top 10 companies in the market, however we sort of want to define, because we'll take, I think, Tesla out here, are still an outsized part of the S&P 500 and really can drive market action. And it was interesting to me, just as we watched it play out throughout the day, it is mattering a lot where these stocks are headed. We spent a lot of the last month or two talking about the quote unquote broadening of the rally, right? And these other sectors can help, but if tech falls off and these big companies fall off, it's going to matter to the market. It's going to be really interesting and important when they start to report. And ASML, as we talked about earlier, even though the ASM ASML executives were optimistic that the rest of the year is going to look better, you know, I wonder if that raises the question in some investors' minds, is this sort of a negative sign for big tech, which they need to do well during this earnings season? Right, and they sort of brought up kind of the cyclical nature of the business, right? right? Which I know we've talked about a lot with, with NVIDIA. It seems like it doesn't matter that they're still in a cyclical business, right? But you wonder when you start to see warning signs like that of the cyclicality that can happen in the semiconductor space, do people start to then bring that thesis back to the stock that has been roaring? I, I don't know, it's to be seen, right? And I think we'll find out more when the, the NVIDIA report's really at the end of earnings. It's, we've still got more than a month until then. But I do think that's gonna be an interesting trend to sort of watch. Broadening it out, mm. choppy market day again, guys. Yeah, you wrote about that today. To yes. me, that it might not just be today that's gonna be choppy. Yeah, it seems like we're, we're entering a different phase of the market, right? For the first quarter of the year, we sort of just went up and to the right. If you didn't really check the stock market for a week and you checked it a week later, it was probably up on the week. That was kind of where we were at. We went up 10%. It was the best first quarter we've had in five years. And now we're down almost 4% to start April. And it feels like we've been talking a lot about, we've been using the word bumpy a lot with inflation, right? Because uh, Jay Powell used it. Well, everything seems kind of bumpy, though. Mm -hmm. Earnings have been sort of bumpy, right? One bank says things are going well and they're doing a little bit better than expected. Maybe you don't get that across 
all the banks. Maybe you're not seeing that across all of earnings. And I think it's sort of contributing to the market action a little bit. But Spoke had an interesting stat out today. They said that the S&P 500 fell more than 0.5% from its intraday high today. It's done that for the last four days. So that means that we're starting, Josh, you pointed this out in the break. Mm. We've been starting a lot of these days in the green and then sort of coming down. I think that's three days in a row we were green. And then, yeah, oh, and three then days fa- probably that we starting were Starting higher yeah. you know, in the green and then fading. Yeah, you know? and normally people don't really take that as that positive of a sign to give you sort of perspective. The only other time in the last year that's happened was the end of October. Mm. Where were we at the end of October? Our most recent lows, right? right. So not exactly great. I'm great Although sentiment. Then stocks back. went up from there. Right, yeah, so it, we're already <laughs> at the bottom of the, the drawdown, Julie. But, <laughs> but you said what? It's the fourth straight session that is down for the, for SPF, the first yeah. time for since, the S&P, first time since early, the beginning of the year, basically. Since the beginning of the year, yeah, yeah, right? So it's just sort of a reminder that, yes, we had a really good first quarter, but that's not really kind of always how it goes. Stocks go down sometimes. Mm-hmm. Stocks go down sometimes. But over the long term, okay. stocks go up. <laughs> there as we go. A, as, again, to quote Miles Udlin <laughs> and Sam Rowe. <laughs> Thank you, Josh. Yeah. Appreciate it. ASML shares closing the day well in the red after reporting that net sales fell nearly 22% from a year ago in the first quarter. For more of the latest moves in the chip sector, we want to welcome in Ross Gerber, CEO of Gerber Kawasaki Wealth and Investment Management. Ross, it is good to see you. Maybe actually, Ross, I'm interested to just get your take. I don't know if you're listening to this kind of broader markets discussion and get your two cents, Ross. You know, SPX, the SP 500, yeah. uh, what is it now? Four straight Yeah, I don't think you need to overanalyze here. a typical yeah, what, correction well, walk, in the bull walk us, market. Walk us through it, Ross. What, what explains this hiccup in your opinion? Yeah, you know, I don't think you need to over, you know, think, uh, you know, a correction in a very strong bull market. So you're absolutely right. Stocks are not supposed to go up every day. They're supposed to be pullbacks. And that's what gives investors the opportunity to reassess and where they can, you know, take advantage of stocks. Because if it just goes straight up, it makes actually my job really hard. So so I think this is a, a, a healthy pullback is what is supposed to happen in bull markets. And it's really predicated by higher interest rates more than anything else. At the same time, if you are a tech investor um, and you're looking at an ASML that is making that kind of announcement, does it give you pause at all? Well, no. In fact, we've been adding to our ASML. ASML is a top holding for us. Uh, It's like, I think, 12 or 13 in my fund GK, along with many other chip names. And this is probably one of the most exciting and important time for chip companies in their histories. Um, So with ASML, they had sort of this air pocket, which, which they've telegraphed because a lot of the chip equipment makers were waiting to see what the Biden administration was going to do with all this cash they were going to give them. And in the last couple of months, really last couple of weeks, we've seen the announcements now of massive amounts of cash being sent to Taiwan semiconductors and others. And that's all going to be spent on ASML machines. So I think we're going to actually see a pickup in orders, as they said, in the second half of this year. And then when you actually look at all the chip you know, factories that are going to be built over the next several years, this couldn't be a more bullish time for a company like ASML, which makes a machine that they are the only company that makes this machine. And this machine is what you need to make AI chips. So it's pretty straightforward. So we're buyers on the pullback for sure. Uh, uh, Russ, I want to switch gears here to another company uh, you have strong thoughts on. That would be Tesla. Shareholders are going to be able to vote again on, on must pay package. What do you think is going to happen there? Well, I think the same thing is going to happen. I, I, I don't think the issue was whether shareholders approved this or not. Uh, shareholders had approved it before and, and probably will approve it again. Uh, the issue is the board of directors never negotiated with Elon. And it seems like when you read the proxy that there was no negotiation about this either. Elon said, well, we're going to put this package back up and then we're going to move to Texas so they can't take it away. And, you know, it's this kind of thinking where the board is just basically, you know, the you know the the dog getting walked on the leash or whatever. It's just not the way companies are supposed to be run. So I I suspect that even if it gets approved, they'll get sued again. Um, you know, so are you just, are you, I mean, you guys are shareholders. Are you going to vote for this stuff? I you know I've been thinking about it because I did vote for it before and. And, and now I feel like the CEO of the company should be working at that company like pretty much every day, if not every day. And so I think in seeing his performance over since he bought Twitter, I would require in this pay package that he come back to work at Tesla full time. But I would vote for it if that was the case. But if he's going to keep working at Twitter every day, I don't see why 
like he's even CEO. You but, know? They're not, like, but they're not changing it, are they? Isn't it exactly the same? Yeah, it's the it, same it, thing. And that's why right. I'm saying it's stupid because even if people approve it, it'll get sued again. And then they're back in court and moving to Texas, I don't think necessarily solves that problem because Texas is trying to run their state as a shareholder friendly state to attract business. And, you know, just because Elon's a big employer there doesn't mean he's going to get the judge he likes. You know what I mean? So I think the issue is the board of directors of Tesla. It has to have independent directors. It's just required by law. And, and until they do this, anything the board does can be invalidated. I, do you think they will reincorporate to Texas, though? How do you think that vote goes? I mean, you know, once again, it really just depends on Vanguard, State Street, and, you know, the major index funds and in, 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 in Glass Lewis and what they tell these funds to vote. So, you know, 15 to 20 percent of Tesla is owned by three passive index funds. So whatever they choose really is where it will go. Um, Ross, you were adding to ASML as the stock goes down. Are you adding to Tesla as the stock has gone no, down? No, it's the it's the opposite. We've been sellers of Tesla over the last six months, and I'm so grateful we did it. You know, if you really chart my fund GK versus Tesla, which was our top holding substantially by a large amount up until let's say November with the anti-Semitic tweets was when we started lowering our position. And and thank God we have because you know we've outperformed Tesla this year by something like 50% differential. You know, and if we would have kept Tesla where it was, it would have been a kind of a dismal year for us. So, so I'm really grateful we took the moves that we've had. We've trimmed Tesla down to a reasonable position. It's about a 2% position in our firm and in my fund. I love the company. I just want to make it clear. The products are amazing. It's a great company with great employees. And I just think it's being mismanaged at this point. And, and it, you know, I think their strategies are not working. So, you know, we've lowered our position. I, I, I hope I don't end up selling out of this position um, because I do think the long term for Tesla could be amazing if it had the focus of a full time CEO. So you're trimming Tesla, Ross. Are, are you putting more money to work in other EV makers? No, it's it's the the opposite. I mean, if Tesla keeps lowering prices and it puts so much pressure on everybody else, and even though I love Rivian and I and I've loved Polestar in the past, it's it's really hard to compete when Tesla keeps lowering prices. You know, because they're such great vehicles. So they've actually hurt the industry. You know, ironically, Tesla's goal was to advance sustainable transportation and energy, and now it's actually helping push it back because of the problems that have been created by Elon. And it's really sad to me, you know, so I don't think, you know, and I have my whole Biden administration hasn't done well by clean energy. It hurt our investors. We've had to get out of solar. We've got out of all pretty much all our EV makers and we have a low position in Tesla. And we we redeployed all those assets into, you know, AI relating themes and, and companies that we feel will add tons of value over the next uh, period of time. And and that's been a great trade for us, you know, sadly, because I'm a big believer in investing for improving the uh, environment. Ross, good to catch up with you as always. Thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks for having me. Coming up, a Boeing whistleblower appearing in front of Congress today. That engineer alleging a dangerous safety culture at the company. We've got more market domination over time coming up.
A step forward in Congress's fight against TikTok, a bill forcing the app's parent company ByteDance to divest ownership could be fast-tracked. To explain more, Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman, what does it mean to be fast-tracked? Well, this is going to be attached with uh, these uh, supplemental security bills, the funding for Ukraine, Israel, uh, and Taiwan, and for humanitarian relief in Gaza. So that is a mechanism to get this thing passed. And honestly, I, I, this is actually looking like more realistic than I, I certainly thought. There's not even, a lot of opposition to it, right? Uh, there, there is some opposition to it in the Senate, but uh, you know, if the House could actually get these three or four bills, however many number there are, actually pass these things. I mean, we've been waiting on these bills for, um, I mean, for Ukraine. We've been waiting on on Ukraine for six months and for Israel almost as long. Uh, and more. there's other important stuff in there, too. So th these now have the, uh, sor the sort of importance or priority level of must-pass legislation. And if you put the TikTok ban in there, then um, it, it goes to the Senate, and then the Senate, this, to get this done, the Senate's probably not going to say, we're going to redo this and send it back to the House, because it, the view is that there's like only one shot to get this through the House. Mm. So this is looking a lot more plausible than I think it did uh, even just a couple weeks ago. Now, just to be clear, um, this is, there are two parts to this. It would, it would, the main thing is to force the Chinese owners to divest ownership of ByteDance. The main thing is not to shut it down. Right. The main thing is to just force a sale. So so this this, this uh, platform that's so popular in the United States is not owned by a Chinese company, but then the ban is the uh, would be the punishment if it doesn't happen. And it looks like there will be a one-year grace period to make that happen. Um, so that, importantly, people are not going to be losing TikTok before the 2024 election is over. I think that's an important uh, thing to point out. Yeah. yeah One thing that's interesting, if you force the divestiture, it's not like I imagine the Chinese are going to let the algorithm come over. I mean, the secret sauce stays in Beijing. So then then what would be the value to potential buyers, just the users? The, the data goes, yeah. the data resides someplace else. And they else. just think, I'll remake so the, this the app? The data that's on, yeah. that of, of all, the, uh, all the user data that the parent company has, yeah. I mean, the concern is, I mean, one of the concerns is that that could all go straight to the Chinese government if the Chinese government ever said, we want it. Um, which they can do. I mean, you can't do that so much here in the United States without certain court orders and stuff, but they can do that in China. Mm -hmm. And also that the Chinese government could use TikTok for propaganda purposes, um, which has not happened yet, um, but the concern is that it could, and they're trying to just head this off. Mm -hmm. All right, Rick, stick, stick around. Uh, we're going to bring in this next one, Rick, too. Gas prices on the rise, helping fuel inflation in March. High inflation also weighing on the Biden administration as the 2024 race heats up. At an event Tuesday, White House Senior Advisor John Podesta saying the president will do what he can to keep prices down. Let's bring in Gas Buddy Head of Petroleum Analysis Patrick DeHaan and Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman is here with us as well. Patrick, maybe just set the stage for us first. Uh, gas prices, Patrick, where are we now? How much have we jumped up so far this year? year and where do you think we're headed next patrick yeah we're up about 60 cents from our january low of 303 we're at 367 kind of teetering on that we'll probably hit 370 here in the next couple of days as mid-atlantic and northeastern states see the uh, effects of the rollover to summer gasoline so we're headed higher but you know we saw a bit of a technical sell-off developing here later uh, after the eia numbers came out they were pretty bearish at least when it comes to gasoline demand, which is still relatively anemic. So, um, you know, there's some light at the end of the tunnel here. I do think gas prices do continue going up for the next week or two, but I'm sensing we're getting close to the uh, potential end of the spring rally. Interesting here, but as we've talked about with you, Rick, many, many times, the direction of the gasoline price is closely tied to sentiment around the yeah. president, and not just President Biden, by the way. This happened yeah. with our past presidents as well. Yeah, ga gas prices. I mean, the typical household spends only about three percent of its budget on gasoline. I mean, this just has a but the mind has share. an outs way outsized effect on consumer psyches. I mean, if if there's one price everybody sees every day that tells them, uh, you know, are things a bargain? Are they too expensive? Is gasoline prices? Um, I, I would ask actually ask Patrick, what is the danger level for President Biden? Do you think in terms of gas prices? It does does seem that when we when we uh, turn over from a number that starts with a three to a number that starts oh, yeah. with a four, that that's, that gets people's attention. Is it just those firm thresholds or is it something else? Yeah, it really is those key psychological barriers here. I mean, we're what, six, eight months away from the election. If we saw the national average at $4, uh, you know, that's gonna have a strong correlation to uh, uh, Biden's approval numbers. And I think they would tank. And so that's really the danger zone. Now we don't see that. Uh, 
you know, there's still the potential hurricane season is supposed to be very busy later this year. I think Colorado State gives a 40% uh, chance of a hurricane hitting in somewhere uh, on the Gulf Coast between Texas and Houston. So that's going to be a wild card. But absolutely, there is huge sensitivity. You couldn't have said it better that Americans, that, you know, the gas prices, whether they need to fill their tank up or not, that's the sense of their feeling about the broader economy, whether it's inflationary or disinflationary, that gas price is really the polarizing number. And I'm also interested, Patrick, uh, you noted uh, recently, if you want affordable gasoline, you said defragment the summer gasoline requirements. What does that mean, Patrick? Walk us through defragment. Well, you know, it, it, as you mentioned there just a little while ago, Podesta signaling that the Biden administration would love to bring down gasoline prices. I don't know how much more I have to shout from the rooftops is that the fragmentation is what really kills gas prices every spring. That is, these different areas across the country have different requirements, different entities regulating them, whether it's the California Re uh, Air Resources Board, which supersedes the EPA. Arizona has its own blend. You know, th this map from 2004 shows 17 different types of summer gasoline in use across the country. Now, it's not that bad now, but it's still uh, certainly an area that could use improvement, stick with one blend, or maybe two, have that in use across the U.S. so that when a refinery goes down in the Gulf Coast or in Chicago, that gasoline can be shipped and, and purchased um, across these state lines. And that's, you know, really what leads spring prices up every spring. I mean, the increase this year, absolutely predictable. And part of the big reason is the switch over from winter to summer gasoline. So, Patrick, I follow you on Twitter, and I notice you're a big fan of the idea of drawing down the strategic reserve to get <laughs> gas prices down. <laughs> Yeah, you know, I, 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 the temptation, I mean, 2022, right, that's kind of a slippery slope there. A lot of folks like to think that's political. Certainly, you know, you can make a strong argument that a $50 barrel jump in oil relatively quick, uh, quickly with the Russia invasion of Ukraine could merit. I mean, it's a strategic reserve, but what it's not is to be used for strategic, uh, strategic price reduction. I know that's probably a temptation, but you know, it, it, it proved its weight in gold, the strategic reserve after Russia. Trump wanted to get rid of half of it to pay down the debt. Biden obviously tapped it. It is strategic, and it's not just there to be used to reduce prices. And Patrick, did you take that Podesta comment where he said President Biden wants to keep the prices low and we'll do what's necessary? Did you take that as him leaving the door open to tapping the SPR? You know, after I did a little bit more digging, some of the sources and a lot of the headlines are certainly, you know, whether they're tilted or, or indirect. And I don't, I, I went through some of the comments Podesta made and it did not seem to me that that was a direct statement, thank goodness, because I'm sick and tired of politicians alluding to the fact of using the SPR. But I think it just highlighted that the administration is watching gas prices. Uh, hopefully they will not use it for simply price reduction. But uh, it's a temptation that politicians have when they see a piggy bank with, you know, 364 million barrels of oil. Uh, it's going to be a temptation. So, Patrick, um, one thing a lot of people don't realize is that we are at record levels of oil production here in the United States domestically. Uh, and it's weird for President Biden. He can't really take credit for that because he, of course, is the guy who wants to uh, get rid of the carbon economy. Is there anything Biden can do with regard to domestic production to bring a little bit more oil onto the market uh, while we're heading into the 2024 election? Or is does he just have to basically be hands off? Yeah, I, I think how he paraded into the White House and went after the oil industry is certainly not, I mean, it's going to be double speak at this point. So uh, the right is already angry that he tapped the SPR to utilize in the, the case of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. They're, they're angry that he shut down the Keystone. They're angry that he uh, made it more difficult to drill on federal land. And, and now if he swings the other way, uh, he, he certainly risks the other side of his, uh, of his electorate. That is, the folks that put him in the White House certainly liked his environmental policy. So, you know, it, he, he's kind of left himself in a corner here, uh, and it's going to be hard to get out of it. There's not a whole lot that he could do to repair that, that damage uh, when he uh, uh, paraded into the White House and immediately took those executive actions. Patrick, good to see you. Thanks a lot. Gas Buddies, Patrick DeHaan and our Rick Newman. Thanks to you both. Meanwhile, Boeing is front and center on Capitol Hill today. Safety officials and whistleblowers testifying about safety issues with Boeing aircraft in separate hearings. One of those whistleblowers, Sam Salapour, a quality engineer, spoke out on what he saw during assembly and warned about the implications. 
I literally saw people jumping on the pieces of the airplane to get them to align. I call it the Tarzan effect. They are using significant excessive force to squash the gaps before you measure it. If you squash in the gap before you measure it, you know, you don't know what you get in. If you get the gap measured falsely, you are not going to shim it properly, and it's a danger to the airplane. It's very, very important. Boeing has put out reports that they say that they can lose almost 80% of the airplane life cycle if we don't follow these protocols. Our Alexis Keenan has been following the hearings and is here with more. So that was just one clip that seemed alarming, right? right. What, what's your impression overall of what we've heard so far? So we had a couple hearings today, and this one was with Salapur and other whistleblowers who had been connected to the 737 MAX uh, crashes. Uh, they are sounding an alarm. Salapur here saying that he raised to the vice president of engineering level at Boeing, that's Lisa Fall. He said that he wrote memos, multiple memos, telling management about these connection concerns. He said he's been a quality engineer for a long time. He's a 40-year engineer, uh, not always at Boeing, but has spent several years in this quality department. And he said that the connections between the parts of the fuselage of the 787 Dreamliner, that they don't fit together properly because the uh, management and the, the company was putting together the aircraft in a way that didn't shim those pieces first, right? Didn't make the connections first, instead kind of forcing them together with what he says was tremendous force and therefore getting inaccurate readings about how it needs to deal with the aircraft as it goes through the production line and finishes being assembled. Now, uh, Senator Howley went on to ask, well, are these planes safe, right? Because in an interview with NBC yeah. yesterday, Salah said that these planes should be grounded worldwide. And his answer to Senator Howley was, well, it's like an earthquake. It's going to happen at some point. You just don't know when. He also likened it to a paper clip. If you manipulate it and you bend it around, that at some point, it's not going to break right away necessarily, but at some point, it's going to have a, a compromise there. Uh, also, Boeing, on the other hand, saying that those claims are inaccurate. They said that these issues present no safety concerns. They said that they simulated 165,000 takeoffs and landings, so the plane getting pressurized and decompressurized 165,000 times in a testing environment, and they said they found no fatigue from those tests. Now, Salapur contends during this hearing that those are muddied waters, that that data is being represented in a way that's, he, he didn't use the word dishonest, but he said the way that Boeing is representing it is not quite accurate because he said that the test plane, now the test plane was manufactured in 2010, uh, that, that, that Boeing has undergone different manufacturing procedures for the 787 Dreamliner since then. But Boeing says, well, that 2010 environment for that aircraft, that that uh, was adequate. They say that the 980 planes that are now in service, that those were made using the same standards. But, so, but just to make sure I understand, they just tested the one plane with all those pressurizations and depressurizations. They're not testing every single plane that they make with those right. criteria. Right, for the testing aircraft. However, there's maintenance that goes on in the years following delivery to customers. So Boeing also contends that there have not been problems, fatigue problems with the planes that have undergone their regular service requirements. Uh, I Also, uh, the, the separate hearing, you, you have to bring that in too to understand the full context of what went on today. We're talking about that. This is another step here on Boeing safety culture. I think we have a thought from that. If we can sure. play it. Yeah, go ahead. They hear safety is our number one priority. But what they see is that that's only true as long as your production milestones are met. And at that point, it's push it out the door as fast as you can. Now, DeLuise, the MIT aviation engineer that you saw there, he and others on the panel, now they're part of a group within the FAA that 
oversees its oversight of Boeing. So what they said is after a long study, uh, they found retaliation concerns that Boeing employees were worried about bringing their concerns about aircraft manufacturing forward to management. Um, also talking about the fact that there's no empowerment by those that are on the production line, that those are put, the mechanics, to stop the production line, that, that things are dealt with after the fact and not right away. So they said that should change. But they had a whole host of recommendations, including involving pilots early in the conversation, early in the design of these aircraft, mm -hmm. in order to prevent these types of problems that Boeing now has had many of from happening. Wow, fascinating stuff. Alexis, thanks a lot. Appreciate thanks, it. Thanks, Alexis. Time now for it to watch Thursday, April 18th, another big day of earnings tomorrow. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing, Netflix, DR Horton, all reporting tomorrow. Netflix reporting after the close, and investors will keep a close eye on the streaming giant's subscriber growth. One analyst saying the company's poised to sustain subscriber momentum due to continuing traction on its advertising tier platform. Uh, we'll also hear from the housing market as DR Horton reports second quarter earnings for 2024. Analysts expecting net new home sales to climb about 14% amid an improved demand environment. And moving over to the Federal Reserve, we'll get a new round of Fed commentary tomorrow from Fed Governor Michelle Bowman and Fed Presidents John Williams and Raphael Bostic. This coming after those comments from Fed Chair Jay Powell yesterday. Powell dialing back rate cut expectations as inflation data has come in hotter than expected for the first quarter. And finally, we'll be getting some housing data, existing home sales numbers for the month of March coming out in the morning. Economists expecting that number to go down ahead of new mortgage rates coming out in the afternoon. And that'll do it for today's Market Domination Overtime. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell. Stay tuned. More Yahoo Finance on the other side.
The cost of car insurance is skyrocketing, so much so that it's contributing to the recent hotter than expected inflation data. Our next guest has some ideas for how you can drive those prices down. With us now, Matt Simon, board member of Trusted Choice and CoverLink Insurance President. Thanks so much for being here. So I guess we should start first of all, with Matt, with why insurance costs have gone so high in the first place. What are the main factors behind the increases that we've seen? Well, yeah, if you think about it, you know, insurance is not immune from the macro trends affecting the economy, right? So inflation being what it is, um, is, is really driving up largely the cost of auto insurance, because when you think about what auto insurance actually pays for, it pays for when property is damaged or people are injured. And so when you think about, you know, property, uh, meaning people's vehicles, homes, things like that, um, cost of uh, car parts have increased drastically since January of 2020. And then the second piece of that, you know, cost of, of medical care, if people are injured, we all know the cost of that has gone up um, substantially. So really the auto insurance industry is reacting to, you know, broader macro trends that are affecting the overall economy right now. And Matt, are, are we also seeing more accidents on the road that we used to? Is that also uh, another possible contributing factor? Absolutely. So, you know, the two uh, big factors now driving the cost of insurance, we talked about one being inflation. The second piece is, is exactly what you said. We've got, uh, from a claims perspective, an increasing frequency of claims that are occurring. And when those claims do occur, the amounts being paid out are, are far higher than what they used to be, which is, is interesting because, you know, you think about when COVID uh, was going on, there was far fewer drivers on the road. So the, the number of exposures actually had gone down quite a bit. So you saw the frequency of claims decline, but even during COVID, the severity of claims, so what was being paid out when those claims occurred, continued to increase and has only uh, accelerated post-COVID. And even now, once we're out of COVID, we've started to see that frequency tick back up as well. So you're in a position now where you have increasing frequency and increasing severity uh, when these claims occur. So let's get to what you can do about it. How do people try to save money on this? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. Um, you know, one is largely within individuals' control, right? So everybody's experiencing auto rate increases right now. The degree to which those increases they're experiencing can vary widely depending on um, individual factors, meaning what's your driving record look like, uh, claims violation or claims violations, you know, um, speeding tickets, seatbelt violations. The, the more that you can control those, obviously, the better off your, your uh, premium is going to be. Uh, the second big piece is, you know, a lot of carriers nowadays are offering discounts for telematics. So carriers, you know, just like most other industries, want more data on their individual drivers so they can better price each individual risk. And they're willing to provide discounts to those drivers that are willing to implement those, those telematics, usually meaning an app that you download on your phone that tracks your, your driving behavior. Um, the other big piece of it is I think consumers need to be smart about how it is that they look at their insurance in terms of uh, how they plan to use it. Um, it's not for the nickel and dime type claims. And so two big things that consumers can do. Number one, look at increasing your deductibles. You know, so many drivers nowadays we see still have $250, $500 deductibles um, when the reality is they probably should be closer to $1,000, maybe even $2,500 if they can afford it. That would certainly help drive their, their cost of insurance down quite a bit, which dovetails into my second um, suggestion is, you know, don't use your insurance for the nickel and dime type claims. So don't turn in small claims if you if you can avoid it. And if you're going to do that, you might as well go ahead and increase your deductibles because you're not planning on turning those smaller claims in in the first place. How uh, how much time Matt, should people um, <clears throat> excuse me spend shopping around? Are there big differences? There can be very uh, big differences depending on uh, which insurance companies they're they're looking to. And so usually, what we recommend ideally is 30 to 60 days prior to their policies renewing, that's the time to begin looking. And in the insurance industry, it's largely categorized uh, in, in two segments. Number one would be you know, captive agents, those agents that only have access to one insurance company. And then the second category is independent insurance agents. Those agents tend to represent multiple different insurance companies. And so whenever those clients work with an independent agent, they can really shop around to multiple different companies to find the best option for that individual consumer. And consumers can go to a, a website called, called trustedchoice.com, um, and they're able to find independent agencies within their, their own town, their zip code, their, their you know, geographic area. And Matt, finally, are you seeing less business? Because people are saying, well, I'm not going to get a new policy. I'm not going to get a new car because I don't want to pay for insurance. Uh, we're, where we're located in Ohio, we're really not seeing that yet. Um, you know, Ohio <laughs> is still spread out. 
Uh, most uh, consumers in Ohio don't have the option to go without a vehicle and auto insurance is a legal requirement if you own a vehicle. So we're not seeing uh, less business. We're just seeing more and more consumers reaching out to us looking for options because the, the prices that they're paying right now have gone up so significantly. Gotcha. And that's in Ohio, which typically has been a more favorable state from an insurance perspective. So when you get into some other challenging states, um, typically coastal states, uh, that that's you know even uh, more pronounced in those areas in terms of the number of and the amount of rate increases that drivers are experiencing. Matt, thank you. Appreciate your time. Absolutely. Thank you. Well, sports teams are becoming big business for big business. We're taking a closer look at Wall Street's hottest new asset class next. Investing in your favorite sports franchise? The trend is growing, turning sports teams into multi-billion dollar asset class. Growing fan engagement and competitive broadcasting rights are some of the reasons for that interest, according to our next guest here with us now, Luke Templeman, Deutsche Bank Research Analyst. Luke, it is good to have you on the show. So you argue, Luke, that actually, um, you know, you look at sports investment and M&A, and M &A, it's actually been one of the kind of the bright spots in the M&A market over the last few years. And, and you argue, Luke, that, that's going to continue. How come? Uh, thank you very much for having me. So, yeah, we put out a big piece on this last week uh, and we identified eight key growth drivers. Uh, I might just briefly highlight three that might be of interest. So the first is that people are simply watching more sport than ever. So our surveys show that over half of young people, so that's 18 to 34 year olds, say their favourite team is part of their identity and they're willing to pay for that. 
Uh, second, there's a growing number of professional leagues. So, uh, and, and these, you know, offer a broader base of investment opportunities, even in small sports like volleyball and track cycling and triathlon. So this breadth of opportunities helps inflate values everywhere else. Uh, and third, there's just more sports specific investment vehicles. Uh, they're raising loads of money and they're emerging because they see profitable pathways to managing a team and then making an exit. And you've also, uh, to your point, there's a lot of interest. There's not always accessibility in all different kinds of sports. For the NFL, for example, they're about to reportedly vote on whether private equity might be able to get involved in the teams. Uh, do you think that's likely to happen? And, and I'm talking American football, by the way, NFL. Um, <laughs> do, you, what, um, do you think that that's likely to happen and what effect would that have on team values? Yeah, that's a big one, isn't it? Because the NFL is obviously the world's richest league. Uh, there's been talk about this for, for ages, and the NFL is the only uh, sort of big sport that doesn't allow private equity. Uh, and it's, you know, it's, a lot of the owners are maybe a little more old school uh, compared with the NBA or, or the NHL and others. Look, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I think it's a matter of time, really. Uh, in the end, there's so much money that is wanting to get a piece of it. Uh, you've got to remember, though, that NFL teams, we're talking big values. So if you're a smaller sports fund, you're going to only be investing in a sliver of that equity. So you're going to need a consortium of a bunch of investors. Uh, you know, how long will that process take? I'm not sure. I do see it as a matter of time, though. And Luke, what are, what are some sort of um, kind of risks to the thesis? You know, one thing you pointed out that was interesting in your research, you know, sometimes fans, Luke, as you mentioned, there can be backlash when big money moves in, right? Mm. Yeah, that's an interesting one. So we found that about 23% of people, and it's a bit different in the UK and US, but I'm just roughly speaking, they say that they don't want big money into their sports team. Uh, and, and this is particularly the case for, for uh, older supporters, not so much younger supporters. Uh, now, this is obviously less than half. It's not the majority. But it does mean that you it's a critical mass, right? And, and you start to attract political interest. And we've seen over the last few years where if fans have a bit of a backlash, sometimes politicians are happy to jump in and start regulating teams or potential leagues uh, out of existence, as we saw in, in Europe just a few years ago. Um, Luke, one of the other trends that you examine in your piece is the effect of AI, which is having an effect on sports like it is on everything else. How is it having an effect on sports? Yes, this is a really interesting one. Uh, look, basically, if you're better on the field, you're generally more valuable off it, right? Um, but the question for smaller teams is how do you compete against the big clubs, particularly if you're in a league that doesn't have salary caps or where the rich clubs tend, tend to stay rich, like in European football. Um, and one trend we're seeing is this drive towards AI-enabled sports statistics. So this is money ball principles, uh, but turbocharged. Uh, and this is a lot cheaper than the alternative, which is, you know, signing a star player or a star coach. Uh, and that means that clubs can become more competitive for a lower cost. And when teams are more competitive, the league is more competitive. And a more competitive league is more valuable for broadcasters. And Luke, we all, we all know about the money um, flowing into the big professional leagues, right? Football, basketball, baseball. What about kind of investment in smaller sports leagues, Luke? What, what kind of trends, themes are you seeing there? Yeah, yeah. So, I, I mean, the best example of this is in European football. So uh, in a lot of the European leagues, you have many tiers. And the idea is as a team uh, becomes better and wins their tier, they'll be promoted. And there's more money in, in the higher tiers, obviously. Now, what we're seeing is uh, people are starting to buy stakes in these lower tier teams, and then they're applying management techniques, whether it's the AI-enabled sports statistics, whether it's a digital transformation, whether it's just sort of throwing money at a problem that needed to have money thrown at it. Uh, and then they're managing that team up the tier. And then if you can get into the UK's Premier League or into European football, all of a sudden you get a big jump in your revenues and that obviously makes your team more successful. And because there's so many of these investors looking to do this, there's a semi-liquid market so you can make your exit. So there's this profitable pathway that investors can now see. 
Um, Luke, all of this is great for people who can afford to buy sports teams. For the rest <laughs> of us, there are a few pathways to invest, right? You've got Man United, which is publicly traded, for example. You've got at least one sports team in the U.S., Atlanta Braves. You know, you've got Madison Square Garden. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, you've got different sporting rights. Um, what do you think is a way for regular folks to, to look at this trend? Yeah, yeah, it, it's a tougher one, obviously, because not many uh, teams are listed. There, there's a few that you mentioned. There's a few others uh, in Europe as well, such as uh, Juventus, um, which is one, one of the big football teams. Uh, so so it is definitely a, a, bit, a bit trickier because you're a little bit hostage to uh, a, a smaller number of teams. I, I'm, I'm not expecting there to be many more IPOs. Uh, of sports teams because it, it's just not something that appeals as much to the public market because there's more of a, a long-term play and you're a bit more hostage to individual events. Uh, but what I am expecting is that more and more of these private investment funds will make themselves accessible uh, at lower levels to the public. Now, you know, I, I don't know what those thresholds are going to be, but we're seeing more and more of them raising more money and they want to be accessible. People want to be part of it. So I would expect that either at the fund level or uh, at an LP level, they will be then become more accessible um, via these private channels. Luke Templeman, thanks so much for sharing research with us. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. We've got more Yahoo Finance after the break. Let's take a look at what's trending after hours. Shares of Las Vegas Sands lower despite reporting an earnings beat for the first quarter of 2024. The casino and resort company posted adjusted earnings of 75 cents a share. That beat the analyst's estimate by 15 cents. 
Revenue rising nearly 40% to about $2.96 billion, just above estimates as well. And CEO Robert Goldstein says the company saw strong growth in Macau and in Singapore, but results of the Macau locations broadly missed Wall Street estimates. Goldstein added that LVS has been benefiting from a rebound in tourism and travel spending in Asia. And shares of Alcoa moving higher after the world's eighth largest producer of aluminum topped revenue estimates for the first quarter. Revenue did fall 2.7% year over year, but the $2.6 billion posted in the quarter beat expectations from analysts. The Pittsburgh-based company reported an adjusted loss of 81 cents a share. That is wider than the 64 cents that analysts had anticipated. Alcoa said its results reflected lower average pricing for aluminum and elevated production costs. Why don't you say goodbye because I read all of that. You know, that's fair. That'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance. Be sure to come back tomorrow at 3 p.m. Eastern for all of your coverage leading up to and after the closing bell.